two of our co-coms who will be on regularly throughout the season. I'm joined by former Burnley player and Republic of Ireland international Keith Tracy and league winning manager with Dundalk, Vinnie Perth. Welcome this, this afternoon, lads. Good afternoon. Um, just quickly, because we do have to go to Coke Park for an update, uh, get your views perhaps, Keith, on yesterday's Community Shield because... Well, I know some people don't... It's never been really a trophy that's taken seriously. It's uh, it's more of a kind of warm-up for the season. But Roy Keane kept saying it last night <laughs> on his uh, punditry that it was a really competitive game. Both teams really went for it. It was competitive, and even me and Vinny were saying off-air as well that we thought you don't really get them. Sometimes they can turn into a bit of a dead rubber. But two teams are really going at each other. And to be fair, Liverpool started really well. They went on top. Then I thought City started to get a little bit of momentum, got their goal, and then they were just starting to come on top, they were torn the screw, starting to move Liverpool. But once Darwin Nunes came on, I thought it really shifted the momentum and Erling Haaland didn't really, you know, you're looking at the two summer signings, I think we'll probably get a little bit deeper into that, but mm. I think uh, I think Darwin Nunes really brought himself to the forefront, whereas Haaland, you know, we won't be playing against Ver- Virgil van Dijk every week, but it was a, a really decent start from Liverpool and I think, you know, City, in the grand scheme and things, won't be too bothered about it, but... For mental, yeah, it's just a little mental, uh, a little mental win for Liverpool early on. Indeed, it was, and the notable thing. Well, there was a few notable things from that Liverpool performance, Vinny, and uh, one of them was that Mo Salah, a man who's just signed his new contract with the club, after a long, long negotiations, he looked really sharp and he looked really up for it. Yeah, I thought Liverpool in general looked really, really strong. I know City had some spells, as Keith said, at different stages in the game, and I think you're seeing. You've seen in the the likes of Jordan Henderson, his running power yesterday was phenomenal. Like the fitness levels of Liverpool were were definitely there and where they need to be heading into the start of the season. That was huge for me. And, and I suppose uh, when you when you when you look at Salah, he just looked like he was right at it. You can tell the modern day footballer uh, lives his life right in the off season, and the days of shifting half a stone in pre season are long gone. So Liverpool looked like they were at it. it looks like all that hard work in pre season paid off. And and now you also have to already look at the tactical switch of, of Man City they don't they didn't dominate the ball as much as they would have normally against Liverpool and that's because the striker who was trying to run in behind so it's fascinatingly set up for a long season yeah it certainly is do you think we don't want to be taking too many I suppose um, you know judgments or assessments from this particular game Keith but does it look like early stages that we're going to have a battle for the Premier League title between these two clubs again I would have thought so, yeah. I think we'd all agree on that. To be fair, it's probably the only the ones on the outside. The likes of Chelsea and Spurs are probably saying they could go and do it, but I don't really see anybody going and being better than Manche- Manchester City or Liverpool, really. I think there's a bit of a gap there that maybe Spurs have closed, maybe Chelsea have got a bit closer, but in terms of winning it, I don't think so. I think it's either, it's either going to be City or Liverpool again. Yeah, absolutely. The fans certainly enjoyed it as well, didn't they, Vinny? You could see even, I don't know if this is something that's uh, kind of grown with uh, Jurgen Klopp and all, but the Liverpool supporters were, again, for a game that isn't usually taken so seriously, they were really up for that game yesterday. Yeah, we do. They are taken seriously in terms of internally, no matter what. Like, you, you, like Liverpool didn't risk their goalkeeper yesterday, so obviously it's not as serious as as if that had been the first game of the season with him. I think he trained tw- twice before the game; he would have started. But in terms of silverware, in terms of the day out, the, in terms of all of that stuff, players really it means the world to them. Um, in terms of winning a trophy, so like all that goes out the window once the 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 whistle starts, and um, you're looking. No matter who you are, you want to be playing well, stay in the team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So no, all of that went, and I think you've seen probably in the stands a little bit of. It's amazing how much it's changed in terms of players. There's a huge amount of respect there between both sets of teams, both sets of managers, but the fans sort of have have built up now a new rivalry between the two of them in terms of they've been mm. going driving each other on you would have to say over the last number of years so now it's really good watch and really sort of it's early in the year but it really webs the appetite for an exciting season ahead yeah it certainly does and it will be an interesting season because there are so many I suppose things to consider transfers players in players out we will have a look at all that kind of stuff also rule changes we've got the five subs there's going to be the break for the World Cup so there's an awful lot to consider 
when you cast your mind over how the season might play out in the Premier League. Just to bring everybody up to date as well on the FAI Cup, of course, the opening round being played across the weekend. It finished 6-0 to Bonaghy against Pike Rovers. Salt Hill against Malahide United, well into extra time there. In fact, just coming to the end of extra time, that match still tied at 2-2, so that's got to go to a penalty shootout, it looks like. Galway... 4-0 up away um, against Bluebell United who had a man sent off it's still St. Patrick's Athletic 2 Waterford 3 and there's about 13 minutes of normal time left to go on that game perhaps St. Pat's feeling the after effects of that trip to Slovenia at the week or during the week and the big Cork derby happening down in Coleman's Park it's Cove Ramblers 0 Cork City 1 and half time in that game and I can tell you it is half time at Croke Park as well in the All-Ireland Senior Football Final between the Meath and Kerry women's team we will be getting an update on that game pretty shortly from Diane O'Hara. Before we do, uh, I just want to um, come away from the Premier League stuff, Keith. Um, Your old club, Burnley, in action, a team who've been in the Premier League for a long, long time, bar one little relegation in the middle, but they were there for the best part of a decade or more. Uh, First game of the season on Friday under Vance and Company, the new manager, of course, uh, former captain of Manchester City. He's made some interesting signings, including Josh Cullen coming in from Manderlecht, the Republic of Ireland international, and he had a very, very good debut on their win against Huddersfield. 1-0 it finished on Friday night. Yeah, I, had, I, I sat down, I watched the game on Friday night, and to be fair, with all the with all the financial stuff going on in the background at Bournemouth, I, I was a bit fearful for them, I have to be honest, but they made some really astute signings. I think it was £3 million for, for Cullen, which for me is a steal. Mm. And he really did show his class against Huddersfield. Uh, just missed out in the playoffs last year, so a decent standard to be going straight in at, and it wasn't the Bournemouth that I played for, and I, don't, I, I love Sean Dyche as a man. We were a rigid 4-4-2, but... The Bournley that played last night, is, it's unrecognisable from the ones uh, under Sean Dyche. It's, it looks like it's 4-2-3-1 with two holding midfielders. And Josh Cullen was excellent. He got the ball, he played he played under pressure so much. And some of the signings they brought in as well have been really, really good. So, And the, the ones they kept as well, they kept the spine of it. Jack Cork is going to be a big, big, a big key for them. Brownhill as well knows how to play there. So look, Burnley, it, it's going to be a tough, long season. Costello, Dara, Dara Costello deserves a mention. He was absolutely yeah. excellent, only 19. So look, he, he's going to be a big part of what they do. There's still a, a couple of question marks over the Burnley team playing this way, but they, they answered them all on the first day. And 70% possession away from home for a Burnley team is a, it's a big, big plus. But look, I'd like to see them do that at home to Turf Moor, at home in Turf Moor on a, on a horrible November when it, it, you know, there's a team just pumping it long and it, it gets it all a bit sticky. That's when the real questions will be answered. But yeah, a little big tick on Friday night. Really, really good. Yeah, another 45 games to go, isn't there, in the championship season. It's going to be a long, long season indeed. Do not forget that football on off the ball is brought to you by Sky. All the football you love in one place across Sky Sports, BT Sports and Premier Sports. Lads, I didn't want to get caught for time looking ahead to the next or the new Premier League season. And... We will take a look at all the clubs, the big clubs and the title chasers, the relegation fodder, possible relegation fodder and perhaps maybe dark horses for the top four. But I want to take a look at the Irish players first because there's some interesting stories we could see develop over the season. Um, we know there aren't as many Irish players or Irish international playing in the English top flight nowadays as we would like to see. One very interesting one, though, is we've got three goalkeepers now in the Premier League. Cuevin Keller out injured. He did miss the chance to play in the Community Shield yesterday against Manchester City. We do know that Jurgen Klopp likes him, though, and that he is basically the second um, choice keeper after Alisson. So I'm sure he will get his opportunities. We shall see how that develops. But two men that could be playing more games than him this season are Mark Travers at Bournemouth and Gavin Bazunu who, of course, took a deal to go to Southampton from Manchester City for about £12.5 million. I have to say, on the face of it, it looks like a good move for Bazuna because he is going to be the first choice goalkeeper, but is he going to a side that could be scrapping relegation this season? Very possibly for me, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I've, I have all the, the signings in front of me and the most notable for me at Southampton is Gavin Bazunu. So, for me... They have James Ward Prowse, he's probably the go to player. You know, if if he was to get injured, he's he's very, very reliable, very rarely misses a game, he's always available. But if if he was to come out of Southampton team, you really do think they'd struggle. You know, they seem to always, you know, take a wallop in a good four or five, sometimes even nine, but they seem to recover and always bounce back and although they seem to flirt with relegation, they never really get bogged down and they might flirt and, and just come away and 
I expect the same. I think I think they'll be there or thereabouts, but they'll they'll pull away. They have enough enough strength in the squad. But but in terms of Gavin Bazuna, I think it's a great move, a Premier League a Premier League uh, club for him. Ralph Hassan, who doesn't look, it looks a good learning environment. It doesn't look cutthroat, you know, similar to Man City. He probably won't, won't play as much football, but he'll be in gold and he, he'll be shot stopping, and that is the main the main goal the main goal for a goalkeeper. So yeah, for me. If he plays the majority there, he's our number one. He has to be. But Travers at Bournemouth, you would think he will he will play the majority there as well. You know, then you're left with Creevy and Keller, who Klopp has said he's probably the best number two in the world. Mm. I, I think he will struggle to get out of there just because he, he's rated so highly and you know, very rarely do you get a number two that you trust and Klopp seems to trust him. So for me, it could look like uh Bizzuno's gonna be the number one again. Just looking at Bazunu, Vinny the, I suppose the most fascinating thing about Gavin Bazunu is, and I can remember even Shamrock Rovers head coach Stephen Bradley saying that he, he's almost regretting that he didn't play him sooner, even though he did come in at a very young age. And we saw him saving penalties in the FAI Cup in the League of Ireland Premier Division. Um, but the one thing about Gavin Bazunu is he's almost like the dream player in that every time he makes a progression, every time he takes a step forward in his career, he just never looks phased. He's always got that confidence about him. And as well, you see in his post-match interviews, he speaks like a fellow who's been playing the professional game for about 20 years. And I would imagine that he is a player that won't be phased by playing in the Premier League, the, the strongest league in the world. No, and I think um, from what I've seen or heard about Gavin is it's just, it's the human side of him. I think that's a that's a big trait that a lot of coaches now look for. Like, there's a lot of talented boys turn up in English Premiership clubs, but when you when you turn up and you've got a real sort of good person, it really really helps now. They 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 watch all of these little things because it's you know there's so many players are, are very close to each other. It's the little the little extras, and Gavin just seems to be a brilliant person off the pitch. The only the only sort of um, uh, hint of caution I would say is I just hope he gets to start next week. And there's no guarantee of that. Like we're we seen we do look at these players with a hint of sort of green glasses and say he's gone to Southampton. We presume he's going to play, and there's just no guarantee of that yet, yet. And I'd like to think he will, but um, definitely going to a coach who has shown a real talent for developing young players, signs young and promising players. So from that perspective, it is a really good move, but it he could end up as a number two, um, and it's because it's such fine margins at the level he's operating at. So. Um, it's really it's it it is it's it's let's wait and see a little bit, but what an opportunity from. Yeah, three o'clock kickoff, Tottenham at home to Southampton. It could be a baptism of fire for. Bizzuno. But it's amazing. The first thing we'd be doing as Irish football supporters is watching the team sheet on that Southampton game just to make mm. sure he's in the team. A lot of us are pres being presumptuous that he will be, but as I said, he's not gone in. Um, um, where you know. A, a club who hasn't got a, a certain amount of talented goalkeepers already there, so. The key is for me is not three o'clock kick off. It's is he in the team at two o'clock? Because I think if he's in the team, uh, he's proved that he can take his opportunities when he gets them. And by the way, Mark Travers must be licking his lip here as well, thinking these two could end up as number twos and I'm a number one. So by right, I should be playing. So Mark Travers in the background here could go from number three to number one very, very quickly. Yeah, and I just had to double check there because I knew Mark Travers played against Tottenham. He actually made his debut for Bournemouth against Tottenham. It was a 1-0 win, 4th of May 2019, and he played brilliant that day. Travers, though, has had to, he almost had to, I suppose, when they got relegated, he had to spend a season where he was kind of kicking his heels a bit, waiting for that opportunity. It came last year, and he showed that he's a really good goalkeeper but, again but for Bournemouth. Again, it's it's you've got to remember, we look at stuff from an Irish international perspective, and rightly so, but... When Mark got his chance with the Irish team, Travers, he didn't really take it. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But he actually went away and played a huge amount of championship football, was absolutely outstanding in goal for them. And was, if you think about the the level he was operating, you keep in sitting on the bench and you had Gavin playing in the league below that. So in, in actually form reasons and, and from the outside we're looking in, Mark had done an outstanding job over the last 12, 18 months at Bournemouth. So... Gavin is the number one, I, I think, in the Irish yeah. setup. I think that's the way the manager will see it, and rightly so. But Mark, the, what Mark has done has really been outstanding outside of an Irish setup. And we, we, we sometimes look at Premiership football and then switch and look at the international scene and forget what happens at the Championship. But it's so important for, for us as a football nation mm. to really understand what's happening at the Championship football level. I think the other interesting thing about Bazuno is that. Um, 
when you think back to Shea Gibbon when he was at his best playing for that Newcastle team, they weren't exactly a great Newcastle side. They were a good side. But Shea Gibbon spent a lot of time making a lot of really good saves. And I think some people wondered whether maybe Shea Gibbon should have been playing at a higher level at that time. But it does go to show you that sometimes it's not always about playing for the best team as a goalkeeper. Sometimes you want to play for the average team so you've got more shots to save and to impress people. Yeah, of course. Look, the, key, the goalkeepers will say that. And Gavin Bazzoni, he, he's a big lad. He, he plays football as well. He's a good footballer as well, which I think Southampton will try and keep the ball a little bit more than they did. But for me, look, he, he, I'm not sure. I, I think, I know Vinny, Vinny rates him as the number one. I think Quivy and Kelleher and Bazzoni, it's a toss of a coin for who, who, uh, who plays for Ireland for me. Yeah. But like I say, Travers is right in the background and I wouldn't be surprised because I know how footballers work when the first Irish camp does come around and there's, a, there's an order established in the Premier League of who's playing and who's number two and who's, uh, who's not playing. I, I feel the number three will quickly get disinterested and just roll away the squad and all of a sudden there'll be a lot of injuries and they don't turn up and I hope that's not the case but I just know players' mentalities when, when this does form we could lose one of these but look they're three excellent goalkeepers and if only one of them was a centre mid or a, yeah. a productive <laughs> midfielder we'd be delighted Absolutely well looking at the right back position right wing back whatever way you want to call it two interesting aspects I suppose in this season from an Irish perspective are Seamus Coleman a man who's kind of I suppose at the end of his career um, I don't know how much game time he will see and then we've also got then Matt Doherty who it looked like he was out of favour at Tottenham for a long long time Vinny but towards the end of last season before he got really unlucky got that injury at such a crucial time for Tottenham but it did look like he was starting to become a player that Antonio Conte wanted to start in his team every week Yeah he, he went through a really really good spell and I think I read recently where he's spoken about it's the fittest man has ever felt and you can tell look Conte's obviously got into spores and everyone is in, in the best of condition and, um, well they weren't during the pre-season because they were vomiting over the yeah. sidelines weren't they yeah, well, but because they were getting worked so hard weight, but no I suppose <laughs> the, yeah but the, the key to that is like as a player in pre-season you, you don't mind that do you really like in terms of, you, want to, yeah. you want to be pushed and as much as um, um, people complain about those runs and all of that stuff but um, it looks like they've been taken to a new level the only thing I will say is um, what Conte has done between the difference between last season and now is he's got real strength and depth so Matt Doherty will, mm. if he's going to play in that team would have to be at the top of his game um, I know they've signed uh, Jed Spent for, for example from Middlesbrough I, I've seen him live three times and I've been really really impressed with him he looks a really hell of a good player and even on the other side they've got uh, Perisic who albeit at 33 I think he's one of the best wing backs in the world so mm. Um, what Conte has done is he's put even even the son of Richarlison albeit we all know Kane and Song are going to play yeah. but even Charlison playing or being there is just a little bit of pressure on everyone you can tell he's that type of manager who pushes people he mightn't be our best mate but he'll push it and um, if Matt ends up in that team it means he's playing really really well and that will in, in turn be good for him Keith uh, Seamus Coleman at Everton you know he's 33 now he turns 34 in October he was probably used quite a bit more than we would have expected under Frank Lampard, who, I suppose, used him as the inspiration, as the captain to really drive Everton to safety last season. And we all saw the, the social media video clips of Seamus Coleman being, you know, held aloft by his uh, manager in the dressing room and that kind of stuff. Uh, but, like, he's going to have competition this season. Nathan Patterson will get a, a run at uh, the team, I'm sure. He's got other options there who can play in at right back. The likes of Holgate can move out there. Ruben Vanagra has been brought in, uh, the former Wolves man as well. So this is a really hard time for a player and when they're coming to the end of their career and they have to realise that I'm not going to be getting as many games as I'd like to. But I don't think Seamus Collins is the type of player that will be a negative, um, I should say, influence in that dressing room, even though that is the, the issue he'll be dealing with. No, I don't. He definitely, definitely won't be a, a negative uh, in the dressing room because he, he's just not that type of lad. Whether he's playing or not playing, I, I've been in Ireland camps with him before. He, he's just not that type of character. He's everything for the team. And you reference what Lampard was saying about him in the dressing room when he stood up last year. And that for me, he will stay the club captain. He might not be on the pitch every every week, but he will stay the club captain because of his values and the way he pushes people on. And for me, Everton, they're not making a hell of a lot of signings. They've got Vanagra on loan, they've got McNeil and Tarkovsky from Burnley, but really, you know, they're not really strengthening. And Lampard has already, you know, sent up a flare saying, you know, if we're not careful here, we'll be in another relegation battle. So Seamus might have to play a couple of very important games. He might be used a little bit more than we, we, we would think. But for me, Seamus is 
he needs to stay at the club, especially with what I would think is probably another season where they will flirt with relegation. So shame is just being in and around and pushing people on, bringing the new signings in, making them feel welcome. I think he'll be, whether he's on the pitch or not, he'll be a big part of everything. Just to finish up briefly, Vinny, um, Nathan Collins, big, big move for him to go to Wolverhampton Wanderers. We saw a fair few Burnley games towards the end of last season. He was really impressive. Never felt like he was going to stay in the championship, especially after the summer that he had playing for his country. This is a huge, huge opportunity for him. Under a manager at Wolves who does look after his defence but also likes to play good attacking football and that kind of suits the kind of player Nathan Collins is. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant move for him. Um, it's a real opportunity. There was a lot of talk about him actually going to a bigger club but I think this you know, this type of club really suits him. It's, an, it's another stepping stone into the, uh, the higher levels of English football which I think he can get to but he's not ready yet so... No point pretending he is, but I think this is a massive stepping stone from it. As we said, Wolves play some lovely football. Generally, it's been a back three as well. So if you played beside someone like Connor Cody, who looks like he actually looks a great guy, I would imagine, or someone to be great to play with, sort of that English Irish lad with a lot of foreign players around him, where you could see a partnership f- uh, forming there. So, um, and again, his style and the way he he sort of. He, he was outstanding for Burnley last year in the prim- Premiership. Yeah. He was really, really was. And he's obviously caught the eye of, of Wolves. And I think as a move, it's perfect. I, I had a fear he would have went to something like Newcastle and became a squad player. But you get the sense he's going to a club where he's going to play and his development will continue to roll on and roll on. And um, just a brilliant sign from him. And as you said, um, because he's such a classy footballer, I think going to his side like Wolves would really, really help him. And that's an exciting move for us in terms of the international setup, um, and a blow uh, for Pats as well, Vinny going out of the cup at the first round. Yeah, Pats are really. I know the fans love the FAI Cup, and um, so that will really hurt them, and shows you the difficulties of coming out of Europe and going back in. Now let's continue with our Premier League preview, Keith, because uh, I want to take a look first at the champions, Manchester City. Myself and Brian Kerr were there in the last day of the season. They so so nearly let it slip on the last day, but. They did what they had to do and they beat Aston Villa and they claimed the Premier League trophy for the fourth time in five seasons. And it is interesting then when you look at uh, the transfer goings on at Manchester City and um, you have to say some good business done by Manchester City. They didn't spend a huge amount. Well, they did spend a big amount, but they seem to recoup that from the transfers out. So in come Erling Haaland and Calvin Phillips from Borussia Dortmund and Leeds United, respectively, a striker and a defensive midfielder. But they've let go Gabriel Jesus and Alexander Zinchenko to Arsenal. Raheem Sterling goes to Chelsea. Bazunu, as we've mentioned, uh, goes to Southampton and Fernandinho. Um, the club captain goes back to his own hometown club back in Brazil. But... Um, I suppose the interesting thing about City is they have no fear about letting players go to rival clubs, which we see some Premier League clubs don't like doing. Um, but it, I suppose that the column out is just as interesting as the column in for for City ahead the new season. Yeah, it's one that we're not really used to with Man City. They're letting a lot of players go, and look, I, I think they're they're still strong. They're still really, really strong in their squad. And I'm an Arsenal fan, so I'm delighted that they've let Jesus and Zinchenko come to <laughs> us. But really, in the grand scheme of things, I think obviously Man City, with the business side of it, will look at it and think: Are Arsenal going to push us for the for the Premier League this season? The answer to that question was no. Will Gabriel Jesus and Zinchenko make them challenge for the Premiership this year? The answer is still no. But we're moving forward under Mikel Arteta, and I think that's why the Arsenal fans are happy with it. Two great signings, but Man City have let a couple of people go. But with Erling Haaland and Kelvin Phillips, I, d- I don't think Phillips will come into the squad straight away. Mm. I think Rodri has obviously nailed that position down. But like they did with Fernandinho and Rodri, they brought uh, Rodri in to learn under Fernandinho. I think Kelvin Phillips will be there. He'll learn for a little while and then he will come into the squad. But look, Erling Haaland uh, yesterday wasn't great. He won't play against Virgil van Dijk every week. We know that. He, he a prolific goal scorer. And one thing for me that, that struck me in the game yesterday was that Erling Haaland, a lot of his goals come from balls into the box, like the early cross in behind. Manchester City don't do that an awful lot because they like the build-up play. So I think it, there will be a little period of getting used to each other, you know, De Bruyne and Haaland get, getting an understanding with Bernardo Silva as well. So there will be a little period to click there, but look, City are very, very strong. And for me, it's going to be a straight shootout again between them and Liverpool. We've, we'll, we'll talk about Liverpool, of course, shortly, Vinny, but we've seen the two clubs sign a big number nine. It's not something necessarily Pep Guardiola has been known for throughout his career as a manager at Bayern Munich at Barcelona. We know he didn't, in fact, famously true 
well I won't say true but he got rid of Zlatan Ibrahimovic who he fell out with he's never been a big fan in fact he's almost like contrarily not used a number nine in his time at Manchester City the so-called false nine this was an interesting signing with Erling Haaland for that reason but the thing about Haaland is as well when you see a lot of his goals for Borussia Dortmund he does latch on to those pullbacks from the touchline quite well he's a good finisher is that what we will see or do you think City are going to mix it up go direct go short what, what, what are you expecting from them? Um, a bit of all of them things to be fair I thought his movement off the ball at times yesterday w- was was brilliant and he just we, City just never picked the pass I think City will change how they play a little bit a little bit if you go back to even even Aguero Aguero did drop into a number 10 position at different stages and help link up the play City bossed the ball against everybody almost he played against and one thing about Haaland I don't see Haaland being that type of player that will come in and, and knit the play or make those small passes he'll always be looking not always but a, a large part of his game will be playing in off the shoulder so I think um, that changes how they play a little bit and it also some teams would prefer that um, That as in uh, uh, you look at a centre half and the modern day centre half now you just want someone to mark I'll mark him I'll look after Haaland and that would be the challenge And but um, and also you've, we've got to say is while well, I expect them to be a huge huge success um, they didn't pay big money in the grand scheme of things Yeah. but the difference between German football and, um, and premiership football are, are, is huge at the moment not in the top teams but the strength and depth in the league and I think it is an interesting watch to see how he really does does he end up with 20 plus goals or does he just go into the, the early teens and it will be fascinating to see but as you said pullbacks all of that City are renowned to get to the end line by in, in many different ways so look I think he'll be a success there but what's fascinating what we all love about football is there's question marks over it as in it's, it's not a new style but it's certainly a change of style and also it's a new league for such a, a, a a phenomenal player that we've seen from the outside. Let's see how he adapts to Premiership football. It will be interesting. He could feed a lot, Keith Tracy, off Jack Grealish, who's had a pretty good pre-season. You know all about wing play, and Jack Grealish maybe didn't figure as much as he would have liked to last season. And we do know that Pep is very slow bringing new signings into his teams. He usually lets them wallow a little bit before he... You know, I suppose gives them that opportunity to become a regular player. Do you think we'll see more of Jack Grealish this season? And do you think himself and Holland could become a really good partnership? I, well, I, I think Erling Haaland, I think he'll get a relationship with De Bruyne, with uh, Bernardo Silva, maybe even with Riyad Mahrez a lot quicker than he will with, with Jack Grealish, just because he's so hard to read. You never know what Jack is going to do on the ball. And I mean that in a good way, but I also mean that in a negative way. You know, if you're a striker and you're making a run across the front post and the ball doesn't come because Jack is, you know, taking his time in it and then he comes back and you make another run and it doesn't come again, the tour time, you're not going to do it. And then the, yeah. inevitably the ball will come. So I think that'll take a little while to click. I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of Jack Grealish coming off the left. I don't think... He is productive, he makes things happen, but... There's so many times, even yesterday, where he had, he had uh, I think it was Matip up his back and Bernardo Silva's five yards away, pass, pass, and he'd rather be fouled than actually just move the ball quickly. And just little things like that just seem to grate on me. But look, He's he, also he, very safe as a footballer. Keith. He is very safe, but I think that's bred into him from being a left winger. He, mm-hmm. he's, he's obviously very good through the middle with Villa, and now he's out to the left, and it, it, it's difficult, and he, he doesn't feel quite as comfortable as he does. And more often than not, he just takes the, the safe option because people nowadays say defenders very rarely jump in, so he walks with it, walks with it, goes to a certain point and then he passes the ball backwards. And for me, that's just not productive enough. When you look at Riyad Mahrez, he will run at you and he will make things happen. He'll go left, go right, play one, twos. So for me, not great. He's, it's not at his best at the left, so I think Haaland will probably make a, make an understanding with De Bruyne an awful lot quicker. They'll, they'll have an understanding and uh, Bernardo Silva. So... I think there will be an understanding there because good players like to play with good players but for me it's just a little bit difficult to read at times. Finney, at the back there were question marks over Manchester City last season because I suppose we saw maybe just some deficiencies in the players that uh, we thought the season previous were so, so good. Ruben Diaz showed he's not, he can be a bit vulnerable at the back. Um, John Stones we know has never been a solid defender all the way through his career. Um, Nathan Ake just well, Guardiola just doesn't seem to trust him to leave him in his team there for so long. Now, it does seem crazy kind of questioning the centre-backs at a team that won the yeah. Premier League title, but 
are, are those issues that could raise their head over the season? Yeah, yes and no. I suppose when you're going to dominate the ball so much, when you're going to be the team on the attack quite often, then it's not as as a as important role as he used to be. So you look at someone like Cancelo. Do, do we really examine his defensive qualities, or are we more? in love with his attack and play and it's his attack and play and that's why playing with the top teams you don't need to defend for 90 minutes you don't need um, but do they get caught out at different stages Kyle Walker at times is defensively gets caught out absolutely um, we've seen Laporte Stones as you said all of them at different stages um, but I just think defenders are made differently nowadays and um, you know uh, if you go back to the Steve Bruce types, Gary Pallister, they wouldn't play in this Manchester City team because the game has changed, obviously. But I mean, in the, in the point of, it's it's now you you can't be everything, you can't be everything. If if you were a centre half and everything, you wouldn't be playing there. You'd be playing in midfield. So it's a difficult one for them. Uh, quite often they're exposed as well, high up the pitch because of the way they play. So the very best teams who have all the ball are vulnerable to counter attacks. But I, I don't see that as a, as a real issue, but I, I do see why they're looking to bring someone in. They they, they definitely need a, a full-back. Uh, they go after... Um, well, Kukurea from Brighton is from one that Kukurea. they're looking at. Is it, is it, it looks like that's about to happen. It's just a mm. matter of agreeing whether it's agreeing 15, points, 30 million yeah. or 35. So I th- you can see, and, I, and I, I think Kukurea is brilliant as well. and yeah. Probably a better defender uh, than Cancelo, but... Cancelo is just world class going forward again it's what do you want it's this battle of styles do you want you know you can you can go if you think of Liverpool as a prime example do you want Trent Alexander or do you want you know Kyle Walker personally I'd, I'd have Trent Alexander all day long and mm. forward knowing that every swap is going to be cut out and it's just a battle of styles and it's it's the modern game and City's defenders sum up, sum up the modern game now they sure do and just to finish on City Kukurea, um, as Vinny mentions there, Keith, he had a brilliant season at Brighton last season. 15 million they brought him in from Getafe, and uh, he just really, I think, he exceeded expectations at Brighton. He's a player that could offer a real threat for Manchester City, both uh, in the attacking sense but also as a defender. Yeah, he looks fairly solid as a defender as well. And like Vinny says, you don't really get that in the wing back positions these days. They're really very good offensively and not quite good defensively, but he looks like he can defend. From the outside looking in, when you're seeing him play for Brighton, he became a fan's favourite really, really quickly. And that's how you know that people think he's a decent player within the ground. And you see him on the ball, he's really, really comfortable, very, very rarely gets frustrated. So he does look like a Manchester City player. I believe he's handed in a transfer request yeah. as well. So it looks like that's going to get pushed through and it will happen. So again, Man City look like they're strong. So for me, I, I can't see past them in Liverpool. I, I couldn't split them in Liverpool. So. It's going to be a great race and, like you say, the World Cup, if somebody comes back injured from the World Cup, if if one of them gets knocked out early-ish in, in the Champions League, they could go favourites for the Premier League. So there's all ifs, buts and maybes, but I am just I'm, can't wait for it to get started. Going back to Kukure, if you have a head of hair like that, you better you be, be good. good. <laughs> yeah, be good. <laughs> it's magnificent, I have to say. I really like it. Um, just eight minutes left to play at Croke Park and tell you there's two goals have come since we updated you last and they're both for the defending champions who look like they're well set on their way to back-to-back All-Ireland titles. Me leading by three point, three goals and nine points to Kerry's 1-7. But still enough time there for Kerry perhaps to hit back and we will be checking in with Diana O'Hara after this match uh, to um, get her thoughts on that All-Ireland final. Moving on to Liverpool, lads. Um, obviously finishing in second place last season and pushing City as far as they really could it was a brilliant uh, season, all told, for Liverpool. I know they lost the Champions League final to Real Madrid. They won the two cup competitions, albeit in penalty shootouts, both against Chelsea. Any season you finish with silverware is a successful season. I don't care what kind of cup it is, whatever. Once it's one of the main ones, FA Cup and the League Cup are trophies. They bring in Darwin Nunes. And they've also signed Ramsey and Carvalho. Ramsey coming in from, from Aberdeen. You've mentioned uh, Carvalho earlier, Keith. And then... Going out as well, interesting for Liverpool. Sadio Mane is gone, Nico Williams is gone, Minamino, uh, Davis, Origi, and Woodburn. Um, I suppose it's the, it's the big one there, Sadio Mane going to uh, Bayern Munich. And I suppose he didn't make any secret after that Bayern Munich, uh, or sorry, the, the Champions League final was over. That That's where he was off to, and that's where he wanted to go. Um, perhaps a blow for Liverpool supporters because he was such a, a favourite player. But maybe not the worst thing for Jurgen Klopp because. It maybe looked like Mane, he's, he's getting on a bit and perhaps was struggling maybe to f- 
do what he was able to do in that Liverpool team over the last few seasons. Yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to say out loud that Mane was waning in any way, shape or form, but what the great managers do is they, they freshen squads at the very right time and you look at uh, as much as Nunes came, or uh, Darwin came in yesterday and was brilliant um, it will take time for him to, to to really find his feet but when you look at Jota's form particularly early on in the season last year um, obviously Salah and, and um, w- w- was outstanding so look uh, the sign of Luis Diaz as well like he, mm. he's he's effectively taken Mane's position really I'm not sure Mane was the out and out centre forward as much as he's done re- really well for them I don't think that necessarily suited him so I think the the timing of what Klopp has done and, and, and the way he's done it is just it looks like seamlessly and that's what the great coaches do and they, they change the squad gradually at the right time and, and they find the right moments to make these changes so for me uh, Liverpool's uh, signings have been really really good I think as a squad they're short I think they could do with a little bit more quality we just don't know where we are with the likes of Curtis Jones he hasn't kicked on and that's that's question marks for me in terms of midfield they have looked short at different stages and if 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 as a, a Liverpool sort of supporter all my life I would say I'd love them to go after uh, Jude Bellingham that's the one mm-hmm. because you you look at speed and power now is all what Liverpool are all about you've seen that yesterday the fitness level he looks like he's at a, an age and if it takes 50, 60, 70 million just go and get him because that's the one position I fear if they've an injury or two they'd be really weak so uh, but but so far the signings look really impressive and you would have to say like all managers he's got some wrong but Klopp gets 7 out of 10 mm. uh, in terms of when he's signing the players Yeah looking at the midfield options interestingly Keith um, I suppose that you would say the starting three as we know Fabinho Thiago and Henderson the captain and then after that you've got James Milner who signed an extra year deal I'm sure he's there, he, he will play some games, but he's there for his experience in the dressing room, I think, mainly. Then you've got Naby Keita, Oxley chamberlain still there, Curtis Jones, and Harvey Elliott. Harvey Elliott's an interesting one. He's 19 years of age, obviously had that horrific leg break last season, and he just never got going once again after that. But he was really good at the start of last season. So if he can find that bit of form that he had last season before that game against Leeds, he could be an interesting to watch this, an interesting player to watch this season. Yeah, definitely. And, and Jurgen Klopp has actually referenced that. I think somebody, one of the reporters, asked him about signings, and he said, "Oh, we have a new signing. Harvey Elliott will be back this year because of the re- the leg break. He, he should be. He would have got a full pre-season into him now. Uh, yeah, he looked okay against City as well. So, look, he'd be like a new signing as well. But there's, you know, when players haven't played in the Premiership or they've only dipped their toe in the Premiership, there's still that question mark: Can you do it for 38 games? You know." November, December, all around January when the cold days come in, that's when you really get to know your players and Harvey Elliott hasn't really been in the deep water just yet although he looks like he's going to be able to handle it the question mark is still there over him like Vinny says, if if you take the likes of Jordan Henderson out or even a Virgil van Dijk at the back, Liverpool start to look a bit thin in places but for me if they if they do keep everybody fit Darwin Nunes looks like he's going to hit the ground running it's going to be a, a really really good race but I, I, like I say, I can't split them. I just, I, I'm trying to give somebody an edge here, and I, ju- I just can't split the two of them. And to be fair, it could come down to Darwin Nunes and Erling Haaland, who's more productive of the two. I don't think we're going to see huge change to the way City play and their shape and that kind of thing, Finney. But looking at the Liverpool team and the signing of Darwin Nunes, I gotta say, I. I like a big centre forward. I like a big old school centre forward. Big in there. Tony Cascarino. There, yeah, exactly. Darwin Nunez looks like quite the sign. He had a good day yesterday at the King Power Stadium. There was some talk, and uh, I spoke to my colleague Philip Egan, who's a, a big Liverpool fan, and he was referencing the fact that um, th- just a possibility they could switch to the four-two-three-one that we know Klopp liked to use when he's at Borussia Dortmund. Um, but also was saying that look, they've played a bit of four-three-three in, in pre-season, so. Again, that's going to be interesting. How do you kind of see how Klopp is going to adjust his formation or will he with this new signing of it, Darwin it, Nunes? It all depends on how uh, Darwin Nunes does. I mean, I, I watched two of the pre-season games where he scored 4-1 and one and he was pretty poor in another one and, and you'd expect that new player coming in. So, players dictated. I, I would say to you, you've only to look at um, the way they changed last year when they signed Diaz. I would imagine he brought Diaz in thinking 
uh, who'll take a while for, you know, bring him into the team. And he just came in and played every week and was just sensational. So it's all relative to, you know, uh, who's who stays fit, what way the team goes, how it goes. So it's a little bit, let's wait and see. But you would imagine Liverpool's um, starting 11, if you were playing, you know, a, a City, a Chelsea their best team is Diaz, uh, Nunes and Salah at the moment as a front three. You imagine that's that's what they, they know and that's what they have. And they have got some little bit of strength and depth in terms of Jota as well, backing that up. So they're in a good position. And I, I, I would say they'll stick to tried and trusted for now. And we sort of seen that yesterday. The high counter press, the, the speed and power in that Liverpool team yesterday, at this early in the season, Mm. was pretty sensational and there was a there was an underline in, in coaching circles about whether Klopp pushes people too hard and he, he pick up injuries and all of this so the rubbish but I think he's got rid of that myth over the last couple of years by and large Liverpool are the fittest uh, team around and they win the ball back stats back it up more than anybody else and Nunez um, I'm not too sure Keith how you see him Will we see him dropping deep much? He does seem to pick up very good positions in the box, which is what you want from a striker. He knows where the ball is going to be, and we saw him as well winning that penalty essay, which was which was very good. But uh, positionally, it's going to be interesting seeing how he does that as well. Because we know Klopp likes the centre forward sometimes to drop deep and get involved with the play. Yeah, well, I think he has the capacity to do both. He's a big, strong boy, and when, once he gets moving, he does really start to move. So he can drop in, play it out wide, and he'll be getting. I'm sure he'll be getting raw after the side for the lines. Goal, Keith. Exactly, he'll mm. he, he will pop in and he'll make the box as well. So, yeah, I, I don't think Liverpool will change drastically. I think he will be told to change for Liverpool's formation. I think they will. They'll go with a four-three-three. Given how he played against Manchester City, I don't think Klopp will see alarm bells. I think, and we have to play to Nunes' strengths. I think Nunes will play to Liverpool strengths. And to be fair, the first game, I don't want to overanalyze it. It's very, very early, and yeah. you know, it, it wasn't a competitive game as such. So, look, he, he looks good. He looks like he's going to hit the ground running. But there's still question marks over him, and obviously there's question marks over Haaland. And we keep bringing it back. Well, I do. I keep bringing it back to Haaland and Nunes. They're the two marquee signings for the boat marquee clubs in the league, and. It, with them being so tight, it's just going to come down to which one of them integrates himself better into the team. It is Mead 310, Kerry 1 7 at Croke Park. Mead have a play in the sin bin. There's just two minutes and 40 seconds left to play in that All Ireland Senior Football final. Moving on then to Manchester United because they finished in sixth position last season. Huge pressure on their new manager, Eric Ten Hag, coming in. Um, I have to say, when he, he was appointed, I thought. Wow, are we starting to see a turn in fortunes here at Manchester United? Are we starting to see some common sense prevail where they get a manager who is maybe not proven at the kind of level that the likes of Guardiola and even Alex Ferguson say going back to Manchester United managers. But this guy has had success in his home country. He's won trophies. He took a very unfancied Ajax team almost to the brink of a Champions League final. You know, that, that game against Tottenham was a bit of a freak occasion and uh, they were perhaps unlucky not to get to that Champions League final where they would have played Liverpool. But he had a really good team there at Ajax and as we see, he comes into Manchester United. Uh, they knew a long time ago that he was coming in. He was announced back in, I think it was April. There was plenty of time there for him to tell them what kind of players he needs. They've signed a couple. They brought in the likes of Christian Eriksen's come in. He signed a couple of... Uh, players that he'd be familiar with from the era Divisi. And yet here we have this long protracted transfer saga with Frankie de Jong from Barcelona and the Ronaldo issue. And, you know, just as you're kind of thinking Manchester United are on top of things here, we still have some of this this kind of nonsense going on. And I'm sure Eric Ten Hag is probably really, really frustrated. And perhaps he's starting to see some of the reasons why Manchester United have been so unsuccessful over the last several years, Keith? Yeah, I think so. Look, I'm like you. I think Ten Hag coming in is a good thing. Some of the things I've heard in the background about him, I can't recall. There was a goalkeeper for Ajax last season that I believe got sold before before his contract was up and he was in the team. And I believe he just told him, he believed he he had down tools after he'd signed his contract away from the club and he just got rid of him straight away. Mm. No, no ifs and buts about it. So he's a disciplinarian. He, he, he's taken a couple of Ajax players as well, which for me, like I say, there's question marks. Not a lot of them have played in the Premier League. Lissandro Martinez, I, I think he's only 5'10 as well. So defensively, I, you know, it's, it's not as 
as easy as getting a big man up against a small man and playing on that, but he will be highlighted from corner kicks and set pieces, so he'll have to learn to deal with the physical side of it. But for me, we, we were speaking off air, uh, Stephen, I think Christian Eriksen is, is the deal of the season, or, yeah. or the transfer market, sorry, a free... You know, he, he's proven in the Premier League, he's proven he can do it at Brentford, proven he could do it for years at Tottenham. And it, it's just a great story as well, isn't it? I think everybody's bought in, you know, given uh, what happened to him at the, at the Euros. It's, it's just a really good story. And like I say, he's proven there's, there's question marks over Haaland, Nunes, over these other people, but there's no question marks over Eriksen. We believe he's going to go in and do it. And if, if he can set the tone at United, all well and good. But for me, the Frankie, the young one, I, d I don't know what, whether United have been given a promise by De Jong that I will come as long as I get me pay up money from Barcelona and that seems to be the issue but for me it's all getting a bit amateur amateurish and I think United should just cut toys, go and get another target and move on from there because you know, I, I don't like these things lingering, I think it does push over to the team and with the Ronaldo one in the background as well, I just think Ten Hag would like this just to be put to bed, get his team sorted and move on. Listen, every team would be like that. They want their team sorted and moved on. But are you going to have Ronaldo or are you not? Are you going to have the Young in or are you not? It's still a couple of question marks up in the air. But for me, I, I, my brother-in-law is a big United fan and I said to him the other day, you'd be lucky to finish in the top six and he, he nearly punched the head off me. So, <laughs> But I, I have to stick with it. I really do think United will struggle. I think there, there is five better teams than them in the league. So... I think they'll struggle next year. It's not the ideal start for Eric Ten Hag in his first season, is it? No, because his task is huge. I mean, he has to get the success he has with Ajax and try and bring that into the Premier League. And it's not straightforward because they're just worlds apart, the Eredivisie, uh, compared to the Premier League. I think I think he's the right... I, I have a feeling he's the right man. We, we won't know. But somebody's got to put an identity back into that club. And you certainly, from the sound bites you hear, he's been very impressive in that. He he is that sort of figurehead that there's a little bit of fear around. Um, Ronaldo obviously doesn't like it. But what Manchester United have to do is they've got to support this manager, uh, leave him in place for as long as possible and let him put a strategy in place that's actually long-term and thinks forward and, uh, and looks at... I think in many ways what happened last year and, and the last 18 months will help him because surely expectations has to be low at that club now in terms of where, where they have been before. So it's really, it's an interesting time, but it, it's been so uninspiring, the signings. It's been really, I, 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 hear, I hear what Keith says about Ericsson, but if you're going to play in midfield in the Premiership with Ericsson and Fernandes, on the eye, that's brilliant. That has real potential to be full of skill and ability but the problem with Manchester it's not there it's what's behind them yeah. it's what's behind them and yeah, I mean Ericsson and Fernandes could be overrun in midfield because of I, I mean if you're going to play the two of them you, you can only play one of McTominay and Fred that's always been the problem they've had to play both of them and also in their full back areas their centre halves they struggle their goalkeepers form if Ten Hag wants to play football um, from the back their goalkeeper has proved he can't really do that that's not a strength of his so it just we looks do, a club in mess say individually you know Luke Shaw is a very good full back uh, Malassia who they signed um, from Feyenoord we don't know how good he is it's but is Luke Shaw really a good full back okay, yeah, yeah. And, and that's the question would Chelsea sign Luke Shaw would Liverpool sign Luke Shaw would Manchester sign Luke Shaw if he's out of contract now the answer is no no, and I don't think even Spurs would. He's, he's back, Harry Maguire, who we know, depending on what kind of game they play, he could yeah. be a good centre back. He's back at him. Varane is a World Cup winner, so you know perhaps that these players haven't played well under previous managers because they weren't good managers. Maybe that this Ericsson High can knock a tune out of yeah, these. Yeah, no, I, I just mean there, there's been no, there's nothing inspiring about their signings. Yeah. There's nothing where you go. They've got a hold of this. They haven't brought in four or five or six players of real note to go into their first eleven. Because let's be honest, that's what they need. They're still Manchester United. They're still a big club. They still be in and around the Champions League spots, and it's. It, it, it will be give or take and they've, they'll have to kick on in mid-season if they want to get that spot but you have to say the Ronaldo stuff looks like a mess the young stuff looks like a mess it looks like there's a, if, they, if they lose two or three or four or five or six seven games you could see the podcast you can see the articles you can see the stories coming out of woodwork and albeit as I go back to the point if you want to be successful at that club you've got to give a manager with real authority to back and to go in and sort out the mess and at the moment it looks like they haven't it just looks like they haven't because I mean we can all say Luke Shaw is a good player we can say Tellez is a good they're, they're not top four they're not they're not top four in, in the best league in the world and 
once you don't have players that are top four, you're not going to get there with a club like Manchester United. The, the strength and depth of the other clubs is just too big at the moment. So you think top four is definitely out of their grasp? Both of you agree on that? Uh, it's a struggle. I'm not saying that, like they're big enough. Like they're big enough to strengthen in the in the Christmas window. They're big big enough to bring two or three players in this window at last minute. So it's hard to know. But I I think they're going to struggle. Like Ten Hag is he's come out and backed Maguire, and you would assume they're going to be a, a fun for pressing team. That means Harry Maguire is going to be in the halfway line. All you need is a foot race with him when you're in. Yeah. And I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, he's a very, very good footballer, but yeah. if you get a speed merchant up against him and play the balls into 60 yard of grass, there's only going to be one winner in over the top. So for me, there's contradictions in the way Ten Hag wants to play with the players that he has, i.e. Maguire being on the halfway line. It's just, it's a, it's a mismatch for me. So there's still a we few We could though maybe marks. see a revival in the likes of Martial, seems to be playing okay. Yes. Jaden Sancho, we haven't seen the best of him yet. Exactly, yeah, but and Marcus Rashford could be revitalised this, this as is well. A, this is like Arsenal. Like, yeah. every, Arsenal go out and sign striker after striker after striker, but the problem's at the back. And yeah. for me, the problem at United is through the spine and with my, the likes of Maguire, Fred, McTominay, they're okay. But mm. like Vinny says, they're not sought after players because they're not at the pinnacle. And if you know you want to bridge this gap between City and Liverpool, They've got to go out, but to be fair, they do shop in a different market these days. Yeah. We have to take that into account. Strikers win games, defences win titles. Isn't that the way it goes? Exactly. Yeah. Look, let's move on to uh, Tottenham because our time is uh, fleeting away from us here. But uh, just looking at the players in, Richardson seems to be a good signing. Eve Basuma coming in from Brighton, a player who was wanted by a lot of clubs. Jed Spence, who you've mentioned already, Vinny looks like a really good player coming in from Borough. The, the only big name really they've let go is Stephen Bergvine gone to Ajax and Cameron Carter Vickers gone to Celtic. Um, sorry, Paris, Perisic, I should mention, coming in as well on a free from Inter and on loan, Clement Longley coming in from Barcelona. Some really good signings there for, from uh, the Tottenham boss, Antonio Conte. Pre-season, apparently he's got them really, really fit and uh, Look, they've got uh, two of the best attacking players still in the league in Harry Kane and in uh, Son Young Min. So, third place finish last season. Could they go better? Oh, I don't know about that, but it, 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 they're going to be in the mix in terms of... You would imagine they'll hang around. They broke into the top four last year. Now it's about... And the sign has looked like that as a club. But can we stay here? Can we can we kick on and gradually build towards getting closer to the top two? But there, as, as you pointed out, their signings have been excellent you can tell Conte's got his way there in terms of a bit more strength and depth uh, when when you've got Champions League football when you've got Premiership you've got to be able to uh, chop and change you've got to have real quality so they've got like real real strength and depth there as I said uh, uh, earlier on per- Perisic for me could be one of the best wing backs in the world on his day um, so really really strong uh, set up is really strong Jed Spence as I said came in it's one of them where it's worth taking a chance on. Uh, he's done at a championship level, looked really good. Hopefully, Matt Doherty plays in that team. And as you said, the the, the signing of the centre half um, uh, from Barcelona, uh, Lange, he, he looks a really good player. And it's quite often these lads come out of Barcelona and do really, really well in terms of have a little bit of freedom. And um, I really like what Conte's done. Fascinate to see where they end up. It is so competitive, though to get into that top two, three in the Premiership. But he's done really good business, and you yeah. can tell. Now there's a bit of unity about Spurs from the top down. You can actually see there was always, you know, you could tell Mourinho and the coach didn't get on. You could always tell there was something not right. But but it looks closer to when um, they got to the Champions League that time. It looks closer to a, to a more settled squad. Not, not that all the players will like Conte, mm. but they will certainly respect him. 